Okay, guys. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's get going so that it doesn't get uh, too late. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Aidan Feng today as the uh, speaker and uh, introduce our future at uh, same Dar series. I've known Aidan for quite some time. Uh, she has been a very prominent researcher in uh, multiple areas. Last time I knew her was uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, that time she used to be doing research in video and images and uh, uh, multimedia areas. She was uh, talking about all the multimedia things. Uh, then I lost uh, contact. She started working in uh, some areas. And she started, uh, I had heard she was uh, going to uh, bio site and she started working in bio. Little did I know that uh, after a long time, I will again be running into her and we'll be working in similar kind of areas. So I was very pleasantly surprised when uh, uh, I started looking at some of the issues in health care. I found that she is uh, one of the pioneers in this area. She was one of the earliest person uh, who decided to start applying machine learning and AI tools uh, in bioinformatics. So she has been the editor-in-chief of the most uh, prestigious journal, IEEE's Computational <coughs> Biology, in this area, and has written books in this area that are considered a standard in this. So we are very pleased to have you here, in our place. Yeah, thanks, Ramesh. I, I guess I'm honored to be the first speaker for the Institute of uh, Future House. <laughs> so, uh, so I I was thinking about what should I uh, talk. Uh, so, um, I have been working on. Uh, well, I bring this. Uh, so this is uh, the research in my lab. So I have been working on. Uh, data mining, machine learning, especially applying data mining into different uh, areas uh, of data. For example, we have worked on social media data, uh, sensor data, uh, biomedical data, but with all different kind of uh, uh, techniques in data mining. But uh, so I worked on bioinformatics for a long time, but today. I hope to actually mention some of the new things I'm working on in text mining with BioData for Health. Okay, so that's, I uh, uh, hope uh, uh, you will enjoy the research I'm doing and hope uh, we'll, uh, no? So, okay. So, uh, as an introduction, I worked on the bioinformatics uh, very much uh, right now, uh, so advanced biotechnology has generated uh, enormous data. So be connection between biology and medicine is a, a big thing. Now how we will connect this and uh, for the health. So now we want to connect the biology with the disease. So we want to find, uh, right now there are still one third of the genes uh, uh, in human body, we don't know the function. So we are trying to find that function. And in smart health, uh, which I'm managing in NSF, it's really we want to see the integration between the computing side and the medical side. So that's what uh, uh, we are looking at. But uh, so in one of the research we are doing is computing how we can help the bio informatics people, biology people, and medicine people, and with AI and uh, automation, what we can do automation in medicine. That's what uh, uh, we, we, we want to uh, look at. So one of the things uh, we can do as computing pr people is the text mining in medicine. So we look at the, so if we want, it's, this is a KDD workshop on data-driven discovery this year, and they mentioned you got a lot of literature out there and uh, how we can mine hypotheses from the literature. That's uh, one of the issues it has been going on for a long time. Uh, is there anything new we can do to mine the literature? Uh, so from here, I want to... What is it? 
Okay, this way? I, it's very strange. Oh, oh, okay. So, uh, currently in uh, one of the, you know, this is the IBM uh, Watson system, health system. So what the people have been doing is building a question answer system which integrate all different kind of medicine knowledge. And right now, for example, it's a Medline, uh, UML as a mesh, uh, right? So if you work in uh, bio and uh, biomedical medicine, you will be familiar with all these resources. And uh, currently, people have integrated all this into knowledge graph. We used to be database and knowledge base. Now, knowledge graph is becoming the popular representation for all the things uh, we can do. So from here, the knowledge graph, uh, we want to build. A, so currently, I think it's already happening in some of the, uh, like in China, people already build a question answer system. And it's used in, in hospital already. But in US, it's a different story. You cannot. Uh, very easily apply or use in hospitals. Maybe some doctors now use it, but not on patients. But uh, uh, anyway, in such a system, what we are really interested in is the self-learning. What uh, from all these uh, uh, resources, what self-learning we can do uh, from here? So, uh, so. That's the general goal, but specifically, when we look at what we can do in self-learning, one of the things is called hypothesis generation. Okay, so hypothesis generation is general, but there is a one direction it has been uh, worked uh, very, uh, about 30 years, it's called literature-based discovery. So literature is one of the resources we have. It's a, it's a very valuable resource that we have uh, now, how we will discover knowledge from literature. So, so um, what we want to do is generate hypothesis, but there are many different uh, things we have in that literature. Uh, so what uh, we can do to accelerate this process. That's what we are interested in as a data mining people, right? How do we accelerate this process? That's the general uh, research topic. Um, so with this, uh, the question we ask is, uh, so um, how we will we accelerate? Then we look at how people do now. Okay, so I look at the social work. If I don't know whether there are any social behavior scientists here, I actually saw some papers. This is one of the papers they study. So, for example, they want to link between the technology and the social issues. Um, so, what are you? So, so, in order to do this, they look at the literature of uh, uh, robotics. So one of the topics is science robotics. One is social science aging, for example. Then is there any relationship between the two? And then from the citation database, for example, literature, can you find any relationship? So that's what they did based on the literature-based discovery. What they found from literature connections, so they found elderly people, the Journalology uh, and robot, robotics, and uh, through the literature source connection, for example, from uh, loneliness, depression, and social interactions to pet, which ro robot pets, mm. and then connected to robotics. Okay, so so that's a connection. So they see the technology is connected to the door to either aging people this way. So this is through that literature uh, path. And uh, prostate cancer and with the surgery and it goes to robotic surgery now, automatic surgery also connect this. So this is, uh, they actually found a lot of connections through this literature search. But this is just one example how they did, okay? So, but uh, what we are interested as computing people, computer science, uh, 
people is how to automate this process so people actually don't have to get involved uh, looking at all the literature. You can automatically do this and giving you any two terms, you can find a connection. So whether they have connections, can we do this automatically? Can we learn this? So this is uh, the, the problem. I, I look at this paper they published. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, problem still. Um, so can we do this? So we look at the literature, how people have been doing this work. Uh, if you are familiar with this literature-based discovery, you would uh, be very familiar with this slide. First of all, uh, people have used uh, lexical uh, statistics related uh, research to look at the statistic uh, uh, documents, documents of frequency, words of frequency, to find a relationship, okay? So that's one of the early work. And then they actually use a relational database uh, with a relation to find semantic predicates. And this is one of the uh, researchers doing to find the relations. And uh, lately, they have been using graph, okay? Graph-based approach to find the connections. And uh, also, people have been uh, trying to use uh, machine learning-based approach to find the relationship. But uh, using machine learning, one of the disadvantages uh, you have to use uh, training data. So how do you get training data to train such model is uh, a very big issue. So this is a, 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 a snapshot uh, of what uh, research have been doing and uh, the progress of in this area. Uh, so now, what we can do, can we use AI, you know, AI is so popular now, automation, you say automatic car, you say all these things. Can we do anything in this uh, data-driven self-learning? I call it data-driven self-learning. In fact, it's a hypothesis generation. So can we do anything? So we look at the, this, uh, and the, the, the most famous uh, you know, innovation in NLP, I would say the most famous innovation is word embedding, right? So the word embedding is uh, uh, transform uh, the, the, the semantic words into, it's called low-dimensional representation, vector representation, because, uh, you know, one heart representation is uh, huge, so that it's not very low level, because uh, normally I think people have used 300, 400 as the dimension. Uh, so, but relative to one heart representation, it's low, okay? Uh, so in, words, in that sense, so low, uh, dimensional vector representation of words uh, is the very big uh, innovation in NLP, which means uh, uh, we can successfully map all the words into vector space, and similar words will be uh, mapped into similar places. So for example, this is an example here to, to give uh, uh, how they map. Uh, it's still going on research, okay, if you, uh, you, you are not familiar with it. So with this mapping, you can, uh, you can think a lot of research can be done. First of all, with the vector uh, operation, you can have similarity easily measure neighborhood clustering, and you can easily find the topics from the vector space, right? So for example, you can easily locate the topics. So that's one of the uh, research uh, uh, NLP people are trying to do so for the topic discovery. Uh, so now, if you are not familiar with it, uh, this is the example I show you what we can generate. This is what it looks like. Each word, what is a word vector look like. And you can see uh, human and lipid has uh, a less uh, similarity than the human and uh, infertility. Uh, so, so that makes sense uh, in this uh, domain, how it works. Of course, this is still going on research and uh, what, how to uh, measure or benchmark such a mapping is still going on. Um, but uh, okay, so, um, but I look at the research, I want to mention what have we, uh, people have been doing in word embedding. So the famous one is uh, the, so, so, so started with people using co-occurrence matrix and to 
uh, use SVD to generate the word vector. And then latest, the Google has this word to vector, which is using neural network. And then the Stanford uh, proposed this GLOW, uh, GLOW which is using glo uh, global and local context uh, to generate it. So they all work, uh, performance are all similar, in fact. So I want to mention here, we use the frequency based because we are using this mesh uh, term, which are medical subject had uh, uh, cur curated by humans on all the articles. This is a very valuable resources for us built by NIH, especially NRM, uh, on all the articles uh, they build. So we are using this as terms to build, uh, as the word to build the representation. Okay, so I hope to mention here. Um, why this is not, uh, okay. So I hope to mention uh, a little bit about the word uh, uh, vector. So I already mentioned the uh, neural network based approach and the growth. And people have used this to understand word change. For example, this paper, Dial Chronic Word Embedding, actually look at the uh, word embedding. I found uh, two, uh, uh, two things. One is the law of conformity, which is showing, basically saying, the more frequent word uh, change, more, uh, it's a, have a ch tendency to change. And, uh, and then this one is saying, uh, oh, this one is, uh, if you, dependency, oh, so if you have multiple meaning of word, it can have a, a semantic change, higher chance of change. Okay, so these are the two, uh, two, part, two laws they found from the word embedding. Uh, in that. Uh, okay, so, so these are the literature people have been using lately. So what uh, we are doing and uh, other people are also doing is how to improve the word embedding mapping. Okay, so there are big research on there. So what we uh, can show is using the ontology, which is the semantic knowledge built on the uh, semantics, and you can improve the performance of word embedding. So for example, if we use the evolutionary ontology uh, information uh, into the word embedding, and then we can show 13% uh, of improvement in the performance. Um, so other people have shown using different semantics to improve the performance of uh, uh, this. Um, so. So for example, here, using the semantics, uh, originally heart and uh, blood vessel, uh, the similarity is 0 0.3, and now using the semantic knowledge, we can actually uh, improve to 0 0.8. Okay, so in general, people agree the word embedding can be improved if you incorporate uh, semantic knowledge. But that's not what uh, I want to talk about this uh, today, it's not uh, on how we improve the word embedding is uh, on how to apply word embedding to the hypothesis generation or data-driven learning. So we look at the, the history of a hypothesis generation based on literature, and a famous example, this is found in 1986, I believe. So, um, so it was observed that fish oil has an impact in renowned disease. That's purely through the literature. Uh, look, and, and uh, apparently the researcher found the relationship fish oil can reduce the blood viscosity, and which is related to re renowned disease. So based on this connection, it was found the relationship between the two. That was a big discovery, actually, in the history back uh, more than 30 years ago. You know what is Reynolds disease? Huh? What is that disease? Yeah, I think it's uh, something with your finger, mm -hmm. that, that thing, that, that's right. So mm -hmm. something related to this, that's the disease. Yeah. And, and the fish oil has an effect. So doctor can answer it. It's just the, a lack of blood flow to the fingers because of vessel constriction. Uh, so yeah, that's why vessel. this is a connection, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, so that's how it worked uh, back then. That. That's a big uh, uh, connection. So starting there, 
the researchers generated a literature-based discovery uh, in this direction, closed or open discovery. Closed means you given two terms. I find the connections between the terms. And or you don't have two terms. I just, from one term, I find all the connections to other terms. So that's two different kind of discoveries that people are trying to uh, study. And the challenge of this kind of discovery is, of course, is efficiency. Because you will search, if you, so given any term or two terms, the literature is huge. The relationship between the choices you can uh, compare is a, is a huge, huge. You cannot manually or even enu uh, enumerate all possible solutions, right? So in the past, the people have been trying to do that. But it's very slow how you will do that. The question is uh, whether we can speed up this process or to be more smart in this process. And uh, so that's what uh, my focus today uh, is on. So the specific focus, uh, the question is uh, given two terms and a date, what are, uh, can we hi have a, a ranked path to explain the relationship between two terms? And uh, uh, so what are the uh, intermediate connections between them and confidence of the hypothesis? Can we do this automatically? That's the, uh, the uh, research uh, question. So, so the goal of your ap uh, application or research seems to be to find out the relationship between two medical conditions? Yes, any two. Hmm. Is there any relationship? But can hmm. we have a system to do that? Right. Uh, so you, you yeah. can go to the literature and you find out that right. on the today's literature. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, so to, to give you any possible solution, but uh, of course you have to, after given your suggestions, hypothesis generation, mm -hmm. right? So you can go through the, the evidence and find out whether this is true or not. Mm -hmm. But first, we, we want to see whether there is a direction we, mm -hmm. we should go. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. So in general, in such a research, you are giving a, a knowledge base, and you are given terms and data. This is the module you want to do. So that's the general framework uh, we are looking at. So the thing is whether we can uh, design such a learning, uh, self-learning uh, module to speed up this uh, uh, is our uh, interest. So first of all, the knowledge base in our case, since this uh, can be applied to general uh, all literature. But uh, since we are talking about health, uh, we are using Madeline, which is a uh, huge literature based, uh, uh, you know, built by the NIH, NLM, and it's a huge resource we should uh, utilize. So first of all, the knowledge base we build out of that is the articles and the mesh terms. They uh, manually uh, uh, curated on the articles. So they have this called the keywords. You call the keywords or they call the mesh terms. So this is uh, the, 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 the knowledge base we have. and. Uh, so from the knowledge base, first of all, uh, we we given a term, okay? So using data, this is purely data mining now. Since uh, we can narrow down using data mining clustering, we can narrow down to the scope of related uh, semantics. We don't have to go the whole space, right? So given any term, we can use clustering to you, word embedding space, not the, the, the semantic word. In the embedding space we calculated, we can just first find the, the cluster, and which gives all the related words with given terms. Okay, first you can do that. And with that, so for example here, you can find, the, so this is just the projection to two dimension of the cluster, what it look like. Uh, with the, the, the word embedded. Um, so with that, uh, so that's just the beginning. Now with the, we can build an iterative process to find uh, all related words, which are appear, co-appeared in some 
articles with some depth. So we can go this uh, iteratively, go to all the, so this is utilizing that uh, collaborative filtering principle, you know, designed in recommender systems. So if you have somebody uh, interested or related friends uh, recommend something, and you see if in the future he will be related to the friends also. So we, we, we given a, a term, we found the clusters, and then we go to each of the pairs in this cluster and find those articles which can cover the correlated words. So we iterative found all this, and then we can build a classifier. Okay, so now we build a classifier which trained with this data and estimated the scope of those words. So after this, Given any data, we don't have to go through the iterative process and, uh, and find the connections. We can, each given data, we can go to this classifier and decide whether it's in that scope. If it is in the scope, we will go through the hypothesis. Otherwise, we don't go through. Okay? So that's one thing after data mining, uh, you can do. This is just how it works in the process. So that's one thing data mining can do to save a lot of passes you have to consider with the training of the clustering and classification. How does this work? So you can see from one term connection and uh, um, how much of this is. So you can see you save the 98% in the first one, uh, the first pair, fish oil and renowned disease. These are the steps gold standard that people have used in the past because it has been known by this date, this has a relationship, okay? So these are the gold standard. I think uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease is related to this uh, and was found in 1994. So with this gold standard, we apply that, we can save this much of passes and if reduce the from this original total pass to this. So you can see just simply applying data mining in word embedding how much you can save. But does this work? Whether you miss anything, that's uh, the thing, right? So I will uh, skip this because that's just the uh, scope. So this one shows uh, among the ground truths we applied, so how many actually we found and how many we missed. So you can see good connection term, good connection term, 48, and the bad connection. So the prediction by the classifier did miss some, but the overall the F score is 91%. And I, I think that's, uh, uh, that's on the original word embedding, no uh, uh, improvement from the ontology. So this actually is a pretty good uh, in the sense of saving the passes, and, but still giving a very good, accurate, accurate estimation of uh, the terms. So this is uh, on the, 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 the data mining, uh, using data mining in word embedding. I will skip this and go to the next. Hmm? This is now very sensitive. Oh, it's a slow. Okay, so the the most important research I want to mention today actually is on this trajectory analysis. So part of from what I just showed you, which we can save a lot of uh, passes we have to consider, we are also interested in the trajectory analysis of words, how it behave over time in history. With word embedding, you really can observe that. So. Uh, with, uh, so for, for this example, we have uh, the documents. Then we, we want to be able to see over the years, for example, in the fish oil, we can see the trends, it changes in the local space. And then we can see renowned disease changes over time. What does this mean? So in word uh, embedding space, we actually show these two terms closer, closer. Finally, in, uh, I believe it's uh, 80, uh, 95, we showed the 95, but uh, in fact, uh, 
It was 85 they found the relationship. So people uh, published articles and uh, found the relationships, but eventually they come closer. Is that clear? Closer. And so through this, we can, yes. What's the x and y axis? Just curious what like... This is just something similar to the P PCA projection. You know, we use this T, S, and E. You know, that the famous uh, projection, project uh, high dimensional data to two dimensions. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a lower dimensional representation. Yeah. Oh, right, what, yeah. what is interesting in this is that effectively, what you are finding is that the two things started out People were suspecting not that they related may be related. at all. And but uh, we can out. find it uh, closer, closer, mm -hmm. these are related. So I show you how we do this. So that how do we do this, right? You have to so this comes to the we call the dynamic word embedding. Uh, so previously we showed that the, the word embedding is static because it was calculated just based on all the documents in the past. You just uh, calculate. But uh, now we want to show it dynamic changes. So how do we do this? So this is what uh, we hope uh, to be able to show. Um, why this is uh, not a very sensitive? Should I point it to this? So, um, uh, so dynamic uh, modeling assumption uh, distance between two word and band correlate. Of course, we have. First of all, we have to admit this, uh, and it's true, the, 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 the word embedding does correlate in semantics. And not just uh, uh, purely similar, it's a relatedness also, right? Like for example, car and a driver are related. They're going to be mapped into similar places. So it's relatedness also included. So if you ask me, how this similarity is measured, it's actually including the relatedness also. So uh, we want, we assume the word embedding evolves smoothly across time. If you don't admit that, then uh, the approach will not uh, uh, be uh, actually uh, functioning well, if you don't admit. But uh, we have been observing all the changes. I think it's true. The word uh, uh, actually evolves smoothly across time. So what we did is we have this map line, and then we actually split into five years in a chunk. So five years, five years, five years. Then we, we try to uh, build the, the word embedding. So. This is what it looked like in the, every five years we build the co-occurrence matrix, right, between the, the terms. And then we will we calculate the word embedded. So that's what it's done. Now here I, I want to mention a little bit about that GROW. So GROW is a static uh, uh, embedding approach it was uh, proposed by these people recently. I think it's 19, uh, no, it's 2016, the last year. So they built this uh, uh, global embedding compared to the word to web because they observe the, the ratio of co-occurrence probabilities is actually work better than just co-occurrence. So this is from their paper giving an example. What do they mean by ratio of uh, uh, co-occurrence. So you, you, if you see uh, the occurrence, so for example, the probability is k on s, and you can see k equal to solid on s, and then k on steam, the ratio actually comparing with k equal to gas is a much more uh, distinguished, right? And then uh, so, they observe, and, but the water and the fashion does not make much difference. So they observe this uh, property and they utilize that into the system to build that word embedding. And uh, so from there, I'm not going to go details on their approach, but this is the objective function uh, with, uh, oh, this, oh, the, the, you actually, you, you, your, uh, your laptop does have a problem to project it. It, it projected wrongly. Uh, 
at least here is wrong. I don't know what happened. But uh, anyway, this is the objective function with the word vector and uh, the context vector, and the b's are the bias terms, uh, and uh, then that's the log uh, effect. So, so it's a difference, right? And it's uh, minimizing the objective function. And this is the, f uh, what happened here? So this is just a, 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 a function to punish the high frequent words there. And you can see this is how it's defined here. So, but if you are interested in how they build this word in Ben, you can go to details on their paper. Um, so this is what they showed, how they map a semantic word into the word vector in two dimensions. You can see slow, short, slower. This is how it behaved. Um, so uh, utilizing, so this is another example they, they have done uh, in mapping. I, I think it's quite successful in doing this, OK? Uh, so what we want to do is build a dynamic model. How we do it? So we actually uh, use that every five years, you have a chunk, right? And then we use this five years, and I will show this first. What happened? It's not very functional. Okay, maybe I just use it. So, did I go? This is the next. Uh, You want to go to the first slide? Okay, so this is uh, going yeah. and this. Okay, I will just use this. Forget about okay. this. Uh, so we want to build a, a dynamic model on top of a static model, and I will show this slide then. So the dynamic modeling here is the uh, what we are doing. So static model, we have uh, the co-occurrence matrix one time at a time, and then we can have this static matrix at each time every five years, right? So you can build uh, like this. But uh, in order to connect them, because if you just uh, separately build them, they're not going to be aligned, right? They are going to, it's not unique mapping uh, between the words and the word embeddings. So they are not going to be. So in order to have that uh, aligned and show the evolution, here is uh, what we do. So we look at the each time to build the uh, semantics, and then we think in order to show the align and also evolution, we will build the, the evolution into the objective function. So here is what we did. So here is the original function, and then we, we add into uh, this is semantic evolution, which combined the previous time point and the current time point with a damping, a damping uh, data, which I believe we normally use 0 0.01, so with a very small factor to consider both the previous and the, 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 the current. So it's combining two uh, different uh, uh, time into the one. Uh, function. So in this way, we we combine the function into uh, into one objective function. We also generate uh, the word embedding every five years time point uh, and consecutively. Is that clear? So that's the main function we did to generate uh, the word embedding. How does this work? Um, so so here is uh, what. Uh, uh, we do, so for example, 2000 to 2004 compass, we build a, 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 a data and then the, 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 the word embedding, and 2005 to 2009, uh, we have one, then we connect them into one. So now we have, uh, every five years we have a data point, right? Every five years we have, and then they are aligned. So you can com compare them in one data space. Did you get this? Okay, so you get it. Does this work? 
how does it work? So here are the things uh, more exciting. Uh, I think it's more exciting. So for the fish oil and the blood, uh, uh, the renowned disease, you can see the trend change. And it's through the, the blood of the You know, if it's a doctor, you understand that this is the term related to both. OK, so you can see they are ch changing, converging, converging into this. Um, we uh, actually look at the more detailed uh, behavior in this. So you can see fish oil 1953 is here, and uh, 1953 renowned disease here. And then through this system we build, we actually see the changes, 83. Then uh, the blood uh, was, uh, viscosity is here, 1983. And uh, where is the fish oil, 83? Here. See, they are, they are coming closer. And this is all through the literature search, you can see they are coming closer. So, so it shows uh, the, the, the convergence of these terms and, uh, and very fast. And uh, we can also use uh, the cosine similarity. Uh, this one is uh, uh, the average similarity between fish oil blood uh, viscosity, which, is, uh, can, which can be considered as a term connecting these two, and then between these three. And uh, you can see at uh, 86, it become peak and then stabilized, OK? so. Which shows these three terms, how they come together, and it will ch not change anymore because already people found uh, the accepted theory of it uh, by then. So we can show this. And uh, so on the other pair, golden standard Alzheimer disease and, and the other thing, I don't know actually what's that, but it's a golden standard. People have found this, I believe, a kind of a close relationship. And we can see, uh, where is it? Alzheimer, this, and uh, you can see the changes, okay? And uh, these are the connection terms here. And you can see the, so this is what we found uh, in our system. Um, so we can, we also found this uh, uh, system, the, 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 the changes here. Okay, so uh, so using the system, uh, in fact, uh, I will. What time is it? Oh, I'm also. So I I want to show. Before I do this, I want to show some more exciting result. In fact, uh, this one is uh, an example my student generated for me. You can see the whole. Homosexuality word actually uh, in 1985 is there, but now 19, uh, 2016 it's becoming here, more uh, closely related to uh, transsexual social uh, uh, behavior, these things. But uh, back in 85, it's more close to uh, totally different things. Now you see the changes, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, this is the one thing my student uh, found, and uh, I think they found something more interesting. That's uh, actually we saw a paper which is uh, published in 2013, I believe. Uh, no, not 2000, 2016, I think. So it's a found uh, there is a, a relation, there is a potential relationship between uh, hunting the disease and uh, ins insulin, okay? So I, there's a, that paper uh, is through the manual research found the relationship. But uh, I asked my students, can you see in our system how it mapped into the system? You can see 2016 Huntington disease and uh, insulin from 85 is closer in 2016 into this disease. Is that clear? So in fact, we, we found this region. Of course, if you don't know the how you will 
try to find the relation. That's the big thing. That's the next step. I don't know whether we will find something totally unknown. We can have a true discovery. This is people already found it, and then we rec uh, relocate it in our system how they behave. Yes. At what distance does the interaction be become meaningful? Have you done like a test against some ground truth? That's a good question. That's a, we have not got into that point as a, what a distance is really. I mean, cosine similarity it determines whether they are related. Right. right. So this is just showing what we have found in the system can really track the behavior of the words changing over time. We really can do that. So uh, yes. one other question that comes related to this is uh, you knew that you want to track these two terms and you started tracking. No, no, no. We don't start tracking. We just see how the system uh, map them. Right. Yeah, no. we, sh we can show how they behave. Of course, uh, if we totally don't know whether right. two terms are related, right. well, you can you can input two terms. No, I, I don't want to. I, I'm going coming from slightly different angle. I want to find out uh, how people were thinking about Reynolds' disease. So I, I don't know whether fish oil is related to that or not related mm -hmm, to that. Mm -hmm. I want to find out only about that disease and mm -hmm. what did people believe about that, what were the causes or what are the remedies of it. Mm -hmm. Then can system do complete data-driven analysis? Yes, well, so that uh, I will come to oh, that okay. later. Okay. Okay. Um, so in fact, this is a, a gay, uh, so originally, you know, in 1950, gay is not nearly related to gay, what we say, okay? In 1950, it's merry, it's happy. Actually, it's what that means, it's happy. Mm -hmm. But now, in, to, in, now in the 90, it gay is becoming uh, homosexual, you know, it's not related to this. You can see the difference. This is not from our system, because the mesh, gay is not a mesh term. It's mm -hmm. not a mesh. It's, this is from uh, the Stanford uh, database yeah, system. Okay. They publish all their word embedded. So I asked my student, can you see how it map in their system? It does show how the word changes through this word embedded. I want to show you this. Uh, so, uh, so in general, I just give I look, showed you all the things. So in general, we look at the, these are the gold standard. We, we so very few of them people have used a lot. And uh, this is by what time people have found the correlation between the two through other terms. And uh, we have run this, and uh, uh, we found the top. Uh, 15 for this one, and uh, in fact, we went, we sh show top 15, and this is uh, on the rank 12. This actually is uh, the, the, the term which originally connect the two. And uh, other terms we found, and there are studies in the uh, PubMed, PubMed uh, uh, how this, that, of course, we also have some uh, other term which uh, too general. Okay, generic and uh, it's not meaningful at all. This is uh, how uh, this uh, uh, behavior and the other one. So, so similarly, the other two, we, we look at the 15 of this. Uh, there are so few uh, gold standard uh, we can do. Uh, so, so these are so so we it actually quite successful to look at this. Um, so this uh, I just showed you this example of how this behavior. So I, I hope uh, you get it, what uh, the system can do, right, to map this. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip the statistic analysis. So this is what Ramesh was asking, the open line. So that's uh, uh, a little bit tricky. So if you don't have two terms, you don't know at, at, uh, at all. You were just uh, asking an open question. Uh, type of question to ask, uh, what are all possible treatment like for renal disease, or renal disease, right? You may ask that. So we can actually uh, convert this into a close discovery by, uh, this, this is uh, the, 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 the close the discovery. So for this one, we can uh, generate a 
kind of uh, uh, constraint. So, uh, retrieve, so, so, so how do we deal with currently we can retrieve matter constraints? Because you have to have something to guide. If you don't have anything, you just say, what are the treatment for that? Yeah. So that uh, is uh, going nowhere. So we actually, what the current system can do is find all concepts belong to semantic type, biologically active substance, okay? So semantic type, for example, treatment is a word that you can extract from your question and use that to go search for the system. So we actually use this uh, to do in the, uh, uh, the fish oil and, and uh, for the treatment. And then we actually, the, the final concept, we found the 104 uh, concepts, and the fish oil is 27 among those. So we can do this way by just randomly search all the treatment, and that we actually uh, found this. So, but that part still need uh, to be more narrow. How that involves some uh, natural language processing in the question: mm -hmm. what do you really want to go? So, so but currently we cannot really go from one term uh, efficiently go to all related yeah. terms. We can find some semantically related terms with the question and use the cross the discover. Okay. But, so that still needs some work. In, in fact, in the natural language and in some other area, what they do is that they consider very big co-occurrence matrices. Mm -hmm. So they start co correlating mm -hmm. each term with a, a, mm -hmm. a other term. And then they keep on tracking which is becoming more significant. Uh -huh. and they, uh -huh. So that, that's uh -huh. how you do the bottom of mm -hmm. uh, another yeah. data discovery. Right. So that is a one exciting thing I want to mention to yeah. you on how we will check the words based on the literature we can do this uh, research. So, so of course people will ask, uh, well these are already people found those, have you found anything new? But that's too much to ask for us right now because <laughs> if we found that, then that's not this kind of talk is publishing in Nature or Science, right? It's a true discovery. It's a true discovery between the medicine and terms. That will be really exciting. Uh, a contribution is enough. I don't know whether we will get into that point. But uh, at least currently we can show, we can do this. Okay. So maybe somebody or a doctor can sit in the system and try different terms and see how they connect. Oh, suspect that some terms are connected and look into system whether they are connected. Of course, but uh, this is a long way to go. Um, so other things uh, we have been doing, uh, we have looked at the, so there is also a, a big research in medicine is the ontology. For example, the mesh hierarchy ontology was built and has been continuing building. And uh, people have been building this manually. Can we do something in uh, ontology exten extension or expansion, you call it? So with this system, we can do this. For example, we, so this is, uh, uh, where is it? 1999. 2000 is like this, 2001 is like this, but uh, people have manually look at the, the terms, how they build, then build the ontology. So with what we have built this dynamics, we can actually look at the, the behavior of terms, and uh, when it get denser, and then that's the point, this term is, uh, uh, has a potential to be split, okay? Because if it's denser, it's to uh, start to have multiple meanings, and it's to split in the ontology. So we can build a system to measure the entropy, if you are uh, familiar with the information uh, theory. So we can calculate entropy, we can uh, predict using deep learning where is the most possible the branch will expand. Okay, so that's the ontology part we also can do. Um, that's one research. So, uh, 
the, so I'm going to, I think I need to finish this. So ongoing other research I hope to mention, this word embedding has been going on not only on more accurately mapping words to word embedding, and people have also used this in EHR. So we use that in literature search. People are using this. Basically, they have mapped, uh, this is called a MED2 vector, okay? So they have uh, uh, mapped the medical code and uh, the visit time domain both into the vector and then do prediction. Uh, you learn code and uh, represent it and then do prediction. So this is from George Tech. Uh, they published this uh, uh, 2016 KDD paper. So it's a very recent, it's all very recent work. Uh, that's the one. And uh, we also built a, a, a wave tool web. So that's actually, the, so biosignals, you have all these biosignals. Mm -hmm. How do you look for pattern, which we call, uh, people call motif, okay, okay. motif patterns. Mm -hmm. So how do you look for motif patterns? It's a, a research people have been doing. So we actually can, uh, we, we just uh, got this uh, uh, published in ICDM this year. So we can actually chop uh, the biosignal into segments, uh, sliding window every three seconds. And then we can actually uh, build the word, kind of word embedding from mm. these segments. From there, we can find uh, motifs, mm -hmm. okay? And, and from these motifs, we actually apply to this uh, scissor detection with, uh, you know, doctors actually have some certain patterns which will uh, be scissor. So we, we can uh, allocate that using this kind of uh, technology. So, this is another research. I'm not going to go to the detail. I will finish this uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, with the uh, current research, it's very much going on research right now. And I strongly believe this is a promising approach to uh, build a lot of uh, autonomous systems. A, a, a lot of things can be automated. This is one of the things how AI or deep learning can be applied in health. I'm just showing this uh, what uh, the ongoing research. Uh, so it requires minimal uh, user you know, interactions. But uh, when I give this talk to uh, another school, and somebody actually asked me, I, I mentioned this, was saying, can, uh, can you integrate the human interactions into your process? Because he <laughs> thinks if a human can be in that process, maybe human will guide it the search uh, into more a direction the human is interested in. Mm -hmm. That may be possible eventually, but we haven't done that. Uh, uh, so how to integrate the human uh, feedback into the, the, yeah. this loop? So that's one thing we can do. Uh, we do, so, so this is, a, I believe, is the first step. Uh, you know, we are talking about automation learning, and so I, I think this is one of the direction we can learn from literature. Okay, this is uh, what I feel. And uh, I think uh, we are confident on this self-learning uh, uh, and uh, hypothesis generation. And I hope eventually we will find something new. Uh, discovery, true discovery, right? Yeah, uh, I, I will end my talk here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Maybe I'll, I'll kick off. So each paper is represented by this Match keyword. terms, yes. But not the actual results in the paper. So right. the paper might right. have discovered Raynaud's disease cure, yeah. but you wouldn't uh, capture it. Then, okay, that's a good question. But uh, uh, you can go whole article to generate the word uh, embedding, but that's extremely difficult because you have to uh, ex extract the words first. And then you have to, so you, your vocabulary is yeah. very big. But remember, that's why we use mesh term. These are cu uh, curated by humans. So it's a re reflect the semantics no, of that. So I understand that yeah. that's a, this is a good thing to use. Uh -huh. The, the uh -huh. keyword is a good thing. Uh -huh. But I think what's missing is the actual exactly. content of the paper. I mean, what was mm -hmm. 
Yeah. For example, I can easily imagine in the biomedical world, two papers would be published at the same time that would contradict each other. Right. Mm -hmm. This is perfectly conceivable to me. Right. I'm not a medical yes, person, yes. but I think given the, the size of this business, uh, would we discover that? I publish a paper and there is another paper. Oh, you want us to discover that? <laughs> uh, that has to go to the detailed uh, yeah. annotation of words uh, and the context. And the connection, yeah. yes. Yes, that has to go. Uh, there are people actually generated the word embedding for general uh, database. Uh, some, yeah. well, it's a, it's a restricted. Some kind of a logical connection between the keywords. The concept A and concept B are inversely related. Mm -hmm. or, so, a little bit more sort of logical structure to the keywords mm -hmm. beyond, mm -hmm. just beside that they all co occur mm -hmm. in the paper. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, so, uh, well, that's uh, more into the uh, understanding of yeah, articles. Yeah, right. You know, now people are talking about the automatic understanding, reviewing of the paper, yeah. and even writing. <laughs> you don't write anymore. Some some um, the robot will write for you, right? <laughs> so this well, this is the beginning of that. <laughs> it's the beginning of that. In, in so. fact, to. Uh, put your question in slightly different yeah, way. In, sure. in, uh, if you go to Google search 10 years ago, uh, it could not differentiate between these kind of things that you are saying. But now they do multiple co occurrence analysis and a lot more context analysis. And that, that's how this world uh, yeah. really start going. Right now, what she's doing is very good co occurrence analysis. And the most interesting thing that I found in the work and correct me if I'm wrong there, is the time-based yeah, tracking. Dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, 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 yes, so that tracking can become uh, very useful. Yeah. Uh, now if you can start introducing multiple co-occurrences, so multiple term co-occurrences, then you can start introducing logic also. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Because this is what we are doing in event mining, that we are developing a complete language for different types of events and uh, uh, what is the time interval and all this kind of thing. And we found that because we can introduce the logic there, then it starts becoming much more successful. What you have is much more powerful machinery for doing large scale analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I hope eventually we will find something. <laughs> that, oh, yes. So what sort of normalization does one do for the fact that some papers will repeat a word many more times than others, and other times they'll mm -hmm. just refer to it in a different way, or for that matter, the fact that the same authors, and this is a general problem, will publish essentially the same paper in multiple outlets? Well, that's more detail. So that, no, 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 I'm, I'm asking yeah. in terms of normalization. Yeah. Uh, that is into more uh, document understanding automatic revision. But this, uh, but remember, I'm using mesh terms, uh, which yeah. are already annotated by mm -hmm. human. So it's not really reflecting mm -hmm. the, how many, you know. Uh, but uh, I skipped the one. Uh, uh, I skipped the, yeah. So in this system, we can actually uh, successfully detect the generic terms. Mm -hmm. Very successful, because, why? Because it does not change over time, okay? So you can see, we can calculate the cosine distance mm -hmm. between the time t1 and t and t uh, plus y. The cosine distance is very little. You can see human, animal, female, male. These are generic terms we can uh, su successfully uh, detect. And uh, these uh, actually you see much more uh, different because it changes uh, over time. The meaning of the uh, of word changes over time. And this actually did not change. Does that give you any hint? What I, I was thinking more about the fact that uh, a paper that mentioned fish oils only in passing once uh -huh. might have less to do than if the word fish oils was used multiple, multiple times. Multiple times. 
And then if you take into consideration, is the word there once, or is its relatively frequency, relative frequency, frequency higher, yeah. then the question mm -hmm. is that it's a more general one as to whether there is some sort of analysis that's standard in the field mm -hmm. that essentially corrects for that by looking at reference. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it's, it's less about the particular example and more about the state of the art in terms of understanding word embedding. Word embedding, yeah. I, th I certainly think uh, something can be done in mm -hmm. that, but uh, I have not done that. Okay. But uh, I have seen people, you know the sentiment uh, analysis? that I, People have been doing sentiment analysis mm -hmm. uh, using word embedding. It's very interesting. So normally, for example, happy and, and uh, uh, sad mm -hmm. are not going to the same place, right? Mm -hmm. Because the happy and the sad mm -hmm. is totally different. So you would uh, ima imagine in word embedding they are in totally different mm -hmm. place. But the sentiment analysis want to classify such word into one place. Mm -hmm. So I have seen people using word embedding on top of word embedding, mm -hmm. adding something else to classify uh, such, making different classification based on the sentiment mm -hmm. analysis. So that uh, you may want to look into that. That may give you some hint of how uh, you can do something like this. So, so, so people have used this for different kind of analysis. Yeah, I, I think it's exciting. Yeah, and, very. But uh, uh, it's a still ongoing research, and uh, we hope we will get more exciting results. Uh, maybe in a year from now, you will see something different, more exciting. <laughs> from, uh, so I don't know. Uh, we will see. Uh, we hope we will find uh, uh, better results. Uh, in in this research, any other? Um. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, actually, it seems like uh, he, the the data set for your system is based on the literature, you know, reports or uh, yeah. papers. Literature. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever Published. tried to you know run your system on top of some like raw data? Yeah, well, that's good, but you can run it on web, uh, but it's not reliable. No, no, maybe like some bio raw data. Maybe like huh? the, uh, you know, uh, I saw some people, you know, working on the electronic records of the, you know, medical records. Uh -huh. That's kind of raw data. Mm. So maybe you can work on some other, like, raw data. To find a, a more interesting discovery? Yeah, because you know um, the literature is actually the knowledge of some researchers or some. Well, we are trying. Remember, we are. If you think deeply, we are trying to mimic what how people think, how you think, student. How do you do your PhD thesis? You go in literature, read other people's paper, right? Trying to connect the, the papers together, find something new. We are trying to do that here, but uh, if you go to completely. Uh, raw data in your uh, uh, sense, uh, uh, well, I don't know whether, first of all, it's not trusted uh, data. Uh, yes. But it may be find something. Uh, but you have to have the sources. I guess you do have the web, uh, uh, cloud sourcing, you know, all this uh, they do uh, have a lot of different. You can try that. Yeah, you can do that. But I think we want to start with uh, trusted literature uh, and see how we can find something useful. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much and thank you very much.